Hello everyone, this is Wafa for another video and today I have a very special guest to interview. I have Jean-Pierre Laporte, CEO of Integri Pension Management Corporation today with me and I'm sure this interview is going to be extremely valuable and packed with advice because he has built an impressive career in Canada. So without further ado, Jean-Pierre, why don't we start? Please introduce yourself. I am a, a pension lawyer. I did study at Sciences Po in Paris and the University of Toronto, University of Ottawa, York University. But uh, perhaps the most important one for me was my law degree. And I used a lot of the knowledge that I accumulated while in law school in building Integris and in building the business. So we'll talk about sort of some of those skills that were picked up along the way, which came in handy later on. Uh, when uh, the business was developed. Now, tell me more about your years in college and at university. In what state of mind were you? Did you want to, as soon as you graduate, start a very linear career in corporations as a lawyer? Or were you more of a creative type or entrepreneurial mindset at that age already? What state of mind were you in back then? Not at all. I, I never thought I would start a business, to be honest. When I was uh, young, I, um, I dreamt of going into the diplomatic corps but I had to come back because of family issues. So I, I had to abandon my studies uh, in Paris and um, go back to Canada. And while I was in Canada, I took a course uh, in environmental law. Law generally was extremely interesting and intriguing to me. So I ended up applying to go to law school. And so that was a very uh, important career shift because I was leaving the whole idea of going to the foreign service and now going more into a legal career. I happened almost by chance to start working in the realm of pension law. I really fell in love with that particular subspecialty of corporate law and decided that this would be my home. This would be where I would try to make a mark. But even that uh, was not the end of the story because being in private practice is one thing, but I have always had a very kind of more creative side to myself, more building something instead of being part of a larger transaction. And a lot of what happens in private practice is transactional. So clients hire large law firms for a particular transaction or purpose. They're not there to have them build something. And that was kind of uh, an interesting development because I was realizing that I needed, I needed to, it wasn't just uh, a wish list. It was a need to create something. And this is why I ended up about 10 years ago creating uh, Integris, my company. So you see, it's a meandering through and lots of chance and uh, no, 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 no real set plan uh, throughout my, my career so far. It must have been confusing, fresh out of college, to always you know, find yourself switching gears and thinking one day that you'd work in the diplomatic field and another day in law. Walk me through that emotional process of at a very young age to keep brainstorming and, and thinking about, oh my God, what am I going to do? For some people, it's a very anxious process. And for some other people, it's it's very easy. You know, it's it's sort of a gut feeling. So how how was it for you? Yeah, it was a bit anxiety inducing, that's for sure. You see other people doing well, and they seem to be going exactly where they said they would end up. And you feel like, what's wrong with me? You know, how come I'm not like that? You have to be looking at the fundamental values that drive you. You know, what is it at your core that you're all about? Is it, is it a desire to enrich yourself? Is it a desire to help other people? Is it a desire to be respected by your peers? So there are, there are so many different drivers that move people. And until you've had a chance to think about those, to examine what are your values, then it's very difficult to do anything because you're just pulled in different directions. So you might be doing something because your parents expect you to do it or your friends, or you think somehow you've picked up something and you feel that this is what you need to do. But it may not be at all congruent with your own values. 
And so eventually there will be a clash. There'll be a day of reckoning. You have to know what it is, what's inside your heart. Like, what is it that you want to do with your life? What, how do you want to be remembered on your tombstone? And I used to joke around because, you know, when I was on, uh, in, in private practice, in big law firms, like in many other places, people run by what I call the billable hour. How many hours did you bill? 2,000 hours, 3,000 hours, 1,500 hours? That's a marker of your value. I didn't want my tombstone to say he was able to bill 3,000 hours. What I also want the viewers to remember from what you just shared is that even in sort of, you know, very transactional fields, you can branch out into more creative areas, but still stay in that industry. And so in your case, you were, you know, at a crossroad between law and finance, and you talk about very, you know, tangible KPIs, such as billable hours, metrics, right? Um, And you could have, of course, done something absolutely at the other end of the spectrum, such as arts or coaching like I did, or, you know, or become a doctor just like your friends. But you also managed to stay within those two industries and carve out your own fulfilling and creative path. And that's definitely inspiring. And I'm sure it will be inspiring for all the whether graduates, but also more advanced professionals that will be watching this video, because at any time you can reinvent yourself and carve out your own path. Tell me more about this notion of carving out your own path and thinking outside the box, because Jean-Pierre was a pension lawyer. And because he knew very well the topic and the discipline, he started thinking there's another way, something's missing here. So Tell me more about thinking outside the box when you're already pretty established in a field. Yeah, so there really were two phases to it. So the first one is what I call my public policy work. And the second one is my private initiative. So the public policy work started with me thinking about our um, federal pension structure. It's called the Canada Pension Plan. So it's a cross-country pension structure that's publicly funded in the sense that each company, uh, an employee puts money in it, but then there's a public money manager called the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board that looks after billions and billions of dollars and invests them in the economy. So this is only a fraction of the total pension system in Canada, but it's an important one and everyone knows about it because everyone sees it on their pay stub. Um, in Quebec, they have a separate thing called the uh, Régime des Retraites du Québec, but it's it's pretty much the same system. Anyway, um, I was thinking that this public plan was truly inadequate. And there should be a way of doing something better than what was being done with it. So I wrote a paper uh, in, I can't remember the year now, 2003, I think. So a long time ago, where I posited the possibility that maybe the Canada Pension Plan should be expanded and made more flexible. Uh, And I won't get into the details of what I argued in that paper, but it was funny because um, at first the paper was ignored. Then it started getting opposed because all the vested interests who saw that this was, I argue, an interesting idea, um, started saying, well, how am I going to be threatened if this reform ever happens? And so uh, some some in the industry were totally dead set against it and started proposing counter proposals. And then finally, the federal government eventually adopted this expansion of the Canada Pension Plan and turned it into law. So... I realized at that point that a single individual with a good idea, a strong idea, and an idea that's meant to help others, that's not self-centered, can actually make a difference. And so that was my foray into public policy. And I ended up doing a lot of work with certain politicians in, in our national capital in Ottawa, and I really enjoy that. And it was exciting to see how, how laws are made, um, contrary to what Bismarck said. 
And um, I, I thought it was great. Anyway, so that was the test case where I came out of my comfort zone and did something that usually no one does, like lawyers don't do that. Um, and I realized, hey, you know, being an entrepreneur, I mean, there was no real money or capital invested in that, just time, a lot of time, but no real, no real uh, cost. Um, I realized that being an entrepreneur in that sense, driving a project forward, negotiating the politics and making it happen was really, really, really interesting and validating. And um, that's what I wanted to, that's where my heart was at. That was my value is to create something, to be a creator, someone that stands out from the rest of the crowd and does something that no one else is doing that's innovative. And that leads me to my second initiative, my private initiatives, which you've already mentioned, is the creation of Integris Pension Management Corporation, where we realized that in the private sector in Canada, unfortunately, those that uh, work there do not have true pensions the way that civil servants and teachers and unionized workers have amazing what we call gold-plated pension plans that have been around for a very long time. But the folks in the private sector, those that are paying taxes to fund the gold-plated pensions as a civil servants, they don't have a pension. So it's, um, it's kind of a pension apartheid. Um, and so I said, well, why don't we, why don't I use my knowledge of pension law to create a product, which we ended up calling the personal pension plan, uh, create a product that would replicate what senior civil servants and teachers have been enjoying for decades and give it to the little guy in the private sector. And that's how the, my company was born. It was to uh, fulfill this sort of uh, mission in Canada to give, to level the playing field, to raise all the boats instead of just allowing some people to have amazing pensions and others to be in substandard products. Let's make sure everybody has a chance at a rewarding retirement. And so that's, that was the, the, the birth of the personal pension plan. And that happened in uh, 2012. With what you said and with everything you've accomplished, you truly are a demonstration of how understanding our core deep values, you know, those who drive us, really can change a career and also help people just come up with new ideas and be innovative and really create change for others. When Jean-Pierre talks about the fact that he wanted to help people and he was you know, really interested in creating something new that would help others so that he would be fulfilled and, you know, knew that he would leave a mark on this world. What he also meant by that is, um, in, in my own words, is he was really frustrated that, you know, all the pension benefits were not available to people who didn't work in large, big corporations. These people, these employees all have access to big pension funds. And, uh, you know, once they retire throughout their whole career, they contribute with their a portion of their salary to a pension fund. And that money is then invested by the company into big, you know, investment funds like BlackRock and so on. And when people retire, they can then access that money um, at a premium or not, depending on the market. And that wasn't available for, you know, private business owners. And so that's why he created his uh, own product that was that is still very innovative, the um, PPP, as he calls it. I also want everyone to understand that when it comes to personal personal pension plan, um, there's, and you can discuss that uh, briefly if you want, there's either the defined contribution or the defined benefits. And I remember that practicing for uh, banking interviews that was you know a very tricky question for many many candidates and I remember uh, you know practicing that question like what is it because on interviews they would be asked what's the difference and some candidates would be ruled out 
And so just to put it very, very briefly, just so that we understand your background and, you know, the, the magnitude of what you've achieved for a defined contribution, uh, basically it, people put uh, money into um, that, that pension plan and it's invested then, okay? And then the thing is, is that it's very risky because once people reach retirement, that money is not guaranteed because it really depends on the state of the market. So it's, it's very risky, but then people can put their own money into that fund. They can add a little bit more to that to grow it faster and then to profit from more benefits at the end versus the traditional you know, pension plan scheme that we would find um, in the past would be the defined benefit. And this one is slowly, um, you know, phasing out. Um, and in, in here with the defined benefit, it's the company that would put on behalf of their employee money in that pension fund. And at the end, when the employee would retire, that money would be guaranteed. Now, Obviously, it's less risky for the employee. However, it costs more to the company because depending on the state of the market, uh, if the market is bad, then the company would have to, you know, put more money on the table to give the uh, pension fund money that they've promised to, that they've promised to their employee. Um, and, and what Jean-Pierre did, and that's why it's very innovative, is that he thought that, you know, private business owners didn't have access to that. And so... It, it, it was a big miss in the market because those pension funds uh, allow people to, you know, have more money when they retire. And obviously it's tax free as well as, you know, when it's on the, you know, organized through a company, then it's like free money, which means that for every dollar that an employee would put towards their pension plan, the company would match that dollar amount. Um, the, the advantages of uh, those pension plans are that they are illiquid, uh, meaning that you cannot access that money immediately. You will have to wait until you're retired to access that money and that they're a bit complicated for ge the general public. Um, and they're a bit risky, as we said, they depend on the, the, the market. Um, but all in all, they're a huge asset. And that's why, you know, through creating this product, basically, I think coming from your value of I want to create something meaningful, I want to help others. And my expertise, my skill set is in the pension fund uh, area, finance and law. You're helping a lot of small business owners to um, make sure that they have a good retirement plan, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's it's sad because ignorance, ignorance of the law. Uh, is very costly. So that's what's happening in Canada is that there are millions of small business owners who have never been told about pension plans for whatever structural reasons. And therefore, they're not taking advantage of the law. The law allows them to significantly increase the amount of money that they can set aside for their retirement and protect themselves from market fluctuations and write off all the investment management fees they're paying and there's, there's all a whole bunch of different deductions and protections that the law allows. The, these people in the private sector have no clue and are not being told by their professional advisors. And I thought that this was something that was fundamentally wrong. And if there was a way of changing that, that was sort of my mission. We are trying to fix that problem. We're trying to educate and letting business owners know that if they want to have a true gold-plated pension plan, they can just sign up for a personal pension plan. That's the end of the story. And they will have a product that's actually slightly better than what civil servants and teachers and unionized workers get from their employer. Our product is slightly better, believe it or not. So tell me, Jean-Pierre, who qualifies to the PPP? Oh, so anybody that's between the ages of 16 and 71 that is receiving a salary from a company that they're connected to. So this could be a doctor who has a medical professional corporation, a lawyer that has a legal professional corporation, a dentist that has a dental professional corporation. It could be a small business owner. Uh, all of these people all qualify for a personal pension plan. 
It also, just so you know, it also applies to what I call C-suite executives of large companies. So CEOs, CFOs, COOs, CLOs, all of the top executives of very large companies, people who are getting a significant, a significant amount of money in the form of salary and bonuses, those are all perfect candidates for a PPP as well. The PPP gives you the, the highest, largest number of tax deductions possible. So there's no other product that competes with it. So if you're a CEO of a large company and your, your, your goal is to maximize your retirement income and to minimize the taxes along the way, you have to sign up for a PPP. You cannot use the other types of pension plans out there. And sometimes people say, you know, this is too good to be true. Why did you come up with that and not someone else that's much smarter than you? You know, they just can't believe it. And I say, well, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Look it up yourself. Open up your Income Tax Act and look at the provisions and you'll realize that I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. But it's very difficult for a lot of people to accept that. It takes time for people to absorb and uh, integrate that knowledge and verify it with others. And then eventually they, they accept it. Now, um, I want to go back to the moment where you were working in a big um, law corporation and, you know, you were very established then in your career uh, as a pension law expert, uh, pension lawyer. Tell me about that pivotal moment where you thought that you would start something on your own and how did you manage the fear of starting something on your own alone? where before, you know, you were backed by teams and brand names and yeah. Yeah. So the, the, that is the scariest part. Uh, that, that is a very, very scary, scary um, proposition for most people. That's why most people don't do it. Um, but again, going back to what we said earlier, when you have this compulsion, this value inside of you that says, no, you must do this. It's like being an artist who must put something on a canvas. They cannot just sit there and not produce art or else they, 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 they become, they go mad or they, they, they become very depressed. I had the same sort of surge of need to do this. And so I knew that this was a very, very risky venture. Um, but I was lucky that I have a very supportive home environment And so I could actually take that risk. And if it didn't work out, I could always go back into law and continue on as a lawyer. When was that critical point when I was in, the, in my law firm where the decision was made, where the realization was that maybe this wasn't what I was meant to do for the rest of my life? Um, I think, I think the, the, the core realization probably happened once One, uh, one day, the law firm brought in consultants and they had us do some uh, psychological testing. All of the young lawyers had to do, I think it was something like Myers-Briggs or something, some sort of personality um, sorting test. And then the consultants went on the board and they showed, they mapped out where people were. And I think virtually everybody was in one quadrant of the board. And then when they called out my name and I gave the letters, I was in a completely different quadrant by myself. And, <laughs> and when I saw that, I said, Ooh, maybe, maybe I don't really, this is not really for me. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, story. I love it so much. I, Obviously, as a, as a wellness and career coach, I'm very familiar with personality tests. Um, I have my clients take some when it's relevant. Absolutely. However, I'm not a fan of classifying people in boxes. And I know it's a very controversial opinion, especially amongst the career coaching community. However, I do believe that we can become who, who, whoever we want. And sometimes putting a label on ourselves on top of so many other labels that we were put on every single day in this society is, is it, it constrains you, right? It slows you down. Um, and, you know, just relating to your story, 
when I was working in, in investment banking, one of the days where I, one of the periods of time, let's say, where I understood that I wasn't, I wasn't right where I wanted to be. There was this quote that I've heard uh, from, I think it's from Albert Einstein. Um, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, um, it'll spend his whole life thinking that he's stupid. And it resonated and it gave me so much life hearing that quote because back then I was really feeling like the odd one out because I felt empty every day and I didn't feel like, you know, I was as engaged, you know, when it came to analyzing numbers and uh, taking part of the day-to-day -day transactions, uh, which was definitely interesting. However, you know, some, you feel that something's missing, just as certainly when you were working as a pension lawyer in a big shot law firm, <laughs> you were very competent, I'm sure, and you learned a lot. However, you know, the, the willingness to learn sometimes and the enthusiasm we may show and display isn't enough. Sometimes if, if there's something, if you're not aligned with what you're doing, if there's something missing, you can, you can definitely spend decades working in that field. Um, but you'll never feel as, as complete and as free as, and as in, engaged as you would feel if you followed uh, your path, or at least take the first step uh, to listen to your values and then experiment with possible field, possible areas that would match that uh, value proposition. No, you can have said it uh, in a better way. It's true. I mean, you, you need to be in an area where you feel like you can add something and where you're good at it. Uh, if you are in the wrong area or it's not something the wrong area. It's just not quite the right area. Uh, then, then, then you have a problem. Uh, I have a, a friend in Canada who always says, go where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated. And that's really, you know, a way of saying, express yourself and do good things in areas that make you happy. Don't just do whatever is required because that's what's needed in, in other areas. And so, but sometimes it's difficult because you might think that you're good or this is your area and you, you know, for pride or other reasons, you will not make a change because you, you just keep banging your head against the wall, hoping the world will change. Uh, when it's really you that needs to change and, and to find where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated. And it's a hard lesson um, because nobody wants to feel like they're failures. I would they thought that they were good at, but, you know, the, the world has a way of disciplining you. And the key is to be smart and to say, you know what? I won't keep banging my head against the wall. Instead, I'm going to do something where I can make a difference. And all of a sudden, the same people who might have been tolerating you now start to celebrate you because they realize that you found your calling. And that's very, very tough, but it's necessary. And I think, um, you know, coaches like yourselves, like yourself, who, who help people get there sooner are really doing a public service, not just to the individual, but to the organization in which that individual is operating. If you were to travel back in time and go back to your 20s, what core lessons would you teach yourself? Yeah, I wish I had had a better sense of what those values that drive me are back then. Okay. I wish I had known myself a bit better. I did a lot of dabbling. That is probably the most important um, lesson. And I have always said that, you know, the guidance counselors, for example, in high schools and were, were just useless. Had there been more, more coaching, more um, just someone taking you under their wing and showing you what's possible, what other people have done like mentors, I think that would have been very, very helpful. If you're trying to do something a little bit different, often there is no, there is no roadmap. You have, to, you have to do it on your own. And, 
And how do you do that when you don't have when you have incomplete information? And that's what mentors and coach coaches can do is they can at least shed some light on a part of the road ahead of you where it's usually dark. And and without that light, it's very difficult to take the next step because you don't know where you're going to step into. The last word goes to you, Jean-Pierre. What would you like to share with the audience? Well, I I think that if you have a, a passion, if there is a mission in your life, you feel that you can do something for others, not for yourself, but for others, and you want to do it, don't ignore that voice inside of you. You know, explore it, talk to people, talk to mentors, talk to coaches, talk to family, friends, socialize the idea, see if there's something to it. Don't just ignore it and go back to work and do your nine to five because you might be missing out on your own life. That's sort of my parting words of wisdom, if I, you can call them that. Perfect. Thank you so much for your advice on all, all of your insights and sharing with us your inspiring career that you've built. Thank you. Thank you.